at the instigation of Eitan Shashinsky, uh, and it was made possible by a generous donation by William Ginsburg and, and also a contribution uh, by uh, the Hebrew University. Uh, I should point out that Bill Ginsburg is actually an old Kenneth Arrow student. And as you probably guessed, the, uh, the, the uh, lecture honors Ken Arrow, uh, who was the founding director of the summer school, uh, and also, of course, one of the, the giants of the field of economics. The idea of the lecture series is to bring a leading economic theorist here to Jerusalem at the time of the summer school. Uh, in general, but not always, the, the Arrow Lecture uh, is on the topic of the summer school, uh, but that's not a requirement. Uh, and I think that the success of the series can be measured in part by um, the list of speakers that we've had. Uh, who in order uh, were Hiro Uzawa, Bang Tomstrom, Danny Kahneman, Partha Dasgupta, Al Roth, Drew Feudenberg, and this time Matt Jackson. Uh, just a word about Matt. Uh, most of you in the room already know him from the summer school, but there are there are some people uh, who may not know that he is the William Eberly Professor of Economics at Stanford and one of the major figures in uh, the theory of networks, the topic of the summer school. He's also made contributions to other areas of economic theory, including mechanism design. And for his many contributions, he's received many honors, lots, lots of recognition, such as the John von Neumann Award, an honorary degree from the University of Aix-Marseille, uh, and election to the US National Academy of Sciences. And so uh, it's a great pleasure uh, and a privilege for all of us to welcome Matt Jackson. So th thank you very much, Eric, for the kind introduction. And um, let me just say a few things before I, we, we get into the material. So, so first, um, I want to thank the Institute for Advanced Studies for putting this on. It's, it's such a great tradition. Um, and and it, it's really been a pleasure to meet so many people um, that are really uh, very interested and, and highly motivated. And um, it's been an exciting workshop. Um, also, thanks to Alkanan and Eric for, for putting everything together, and the staff here has been amazing, so it, it's, it's quite a pleasure. Um, let me say a couple words about Ken. It, you know, it, it's always hard to say anything about Ken that probably hasn't already been said. Um, but I think, you know, it, in, and actually working in networks, you would imagine that you, you're working in an area that Ken hasn't already worked in. So that there, you, know, you think of all the areas in economics he's worked in. Um, it turns out that he has a really nice paper with um, Ron Borzakowski, if you haven't seen it before, on job contact networks and uh, how, how you can explain wage differentials between races by looking at, at numbers of contacts. So, so even if you're venturing in the networks area, you'll run into Ken's work. So it's hard not to run into his work. And I think you know, what, one message, since there's a lot of people who are still students here and, and working on research, you know, when you look at people who have made so many important contributions in a research area and you ask, you know, what kinds of things really go into that, um, I think one thing that always struck me, uh, especially about Ken, is it's, you know, people need talent and you need uh, abilities to, to make things work. But one thing that's particularly striking is the number of questions that Ken asks. And, and asking questions about everything that you see and constantly asking questions, I think, is a, is a really great route to, to, to discovering important things about the world. And um, I, you've all had the you know, pleasure of being here with, with Ken, and I think 
um, that's one of the things I appreciate most about his abilities, and it's something that we should all learn from. Okay, so, so now on to um, today's topic. I'm going to be talking about a, a project, a long going, basically a decade long project with Abhijit Banerjee, Arun Chandra Sikhar, and Esther Duflo. And we've been collecting data in southern India and trying to understand how networks of relationships end up affecting the behavior of, of individuals. And let me start, you know, just for this um, crowd by saying a little bit about, you know, where economics fits into this and where theory fits into this. And the idea of this talk is going to be to, to integrate a little bit of theory with um, data and, and show us why it's important to still have models and so forth. And I think, you know, in this sort of era of big data that we, we're hearing about data mining, the data will speak to us, computational social sciences and so forth, it's easy to, to believe that, that modeling and economic theory is going to be something of the past. And I think it's important to remember that these kinds of models are really the ones that are going to make um, sense of what we should be looking at in these seas of data and exactly how we should understand the data, how to make sense of it, how to organize it. And without the, the discipline of the models, it's going to be easy to find spurious correlations. It's going to be easy to find things that lead us down blind, blind alleys. And you know, that, that's sort of making sense of it. But also, we're going to need to be able to, to try and figure out how to structure policies, what might be happening out of sample, and these kinds of things, modeling is essential. Now, you know, this is something that has that you know, been said many times, but I, I just wanted to emphasize that. And, and I think you know, one of the, the themes underlying this talk will be to, to use modeling to help us explain data. OK, so what's the big picture? Um, we don't need as, as much of it given the crowd here, but you know, economic interactions are embedded in network structures. How does the network structure um, impact these kinds of behaviors? And today's focus is going to be on diffusion of information and diffusion of a product through a population. And in particular, um, you know, networks are going to be shaping information flows, and that's going to affect who knows what about the world and, and what kinds of opportunities they've ha they have access to. And a second theme that we haven't touched on at all in the, in the summer school so far, and we'll, we'll be exploring here, is that the networks also um, affect what you know about the structure around you. And, and let me say a little bit about that. So um, David Crackhart and, and others have studied, you know, a ask people to name friends of friends. So not to name your friends, that's easy. Um, name friends of friends and name what their connections are. So try and draw the network beyond just your immediate friendship network. That's not an easy thing to do, and, and people tend not to be very good at it. So the empirical work that's been done suggests that people are remarkably ignorant of, uh, of who their friends' friends are. They're not very good at being able to, you know, going into a company and sort of drawing who talks to whom beyond the people that they talk to. It, it, it's, not, it's not something they're very good at. And yet, um, people are still able to, to navigate networks fairly well. And in particular, we're going to show you that they're able to name people out of an organization with high accuracy that are going to be good diffusers of information. And we might ask, how is it that, that they're able to learn things about the network and still not be able to draw the network? How is it that we know a lot about the, the structure around us, but we can't actually draw that structure? And so I, uh, that's going to be one of the main themes of, of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, at the end, I'll say a little bit about these uh, sort of a feedback effect that um, you know, information networks are also going to be f influenced by the behaviors. So there's going to be feedback and, and information. Uh, um, the networks themselves are going to be endogenous. And I'll come back to that at the very end. Um, OK, so what, what are the main kinds of things we're going to be thinking about here? First of all, we're going to try and define how it is that we should be looking at influence and centrality in a network when we're interested in understanding diffusion and um, the spread of information in a society. Um, the, we'll develop a new measure, and, I, and I'll talk about how that relates to other measures. Secondly, um, we'll ask this question, are people aware of, of networks beyond their own neighborhoods? And we'll show that they are in a very specific way that, that goes beyond this idea of being able to draw networks. And then we'll answer the question of how they might be able to do that. So I won't be able to tell you exactly that that's the reason that they're doing this, but I'll be able to explain that there's a reason that we might expect them to be able to, 
to, to tell us who the good diffusers are in the society. Okay. So basic outline, I'm going to talk about information diffusion in networks. So we're going to start by the measuring centrality, and then we'll, we'll go into this issue of how do people know who's central in a network. And that's where the gossip is going to come in. So the, one of the messages is going to be, I'm, I'm somebody who's constantly being hit by information, and to the extent that I can trace that information back, that'll teach me something about who the information came from, and I can use that to make inferences about people's position in the network. Okay. Um, so how to measure centrality for diffusion. What I'm going to do is start by empirical background in the project we've been working on. Um, so we're looking at microfinance participation in, in a set of, of rural villages in India. So we started working in Karnataka in about 2006. So this is rural southern India. And there was a bank going into a series of villages. And what they were doing is offering microfinance in these villages. So they were going in and offering formal loans. And before that, the villages had not had access to loans. And the way that the bank spread information through different villages by, was by word of mouth. So they couldn't advertise. They didn't have methods of, of reaching people directly. And, and for various reasons, they didn't go through the political system. And I can talk about that offline. But they didn't want to use the uh, Gram Panchayat, the elected officials in, inside the village. So instead, what they did was they would just go in and try and identify central people in the village, tell those people, look, spread the news. We're a microfinance organization. We're going to come into your village. And we're going to start offering loans. So tell other people, um, we'll be back in, in uh, two weeks. Tell people to come to our meeting and, and they can uh, take out loans. So that, yeah, so the village is 1,000 people. And, and so, yeah, they're, they're, so we'll, we'll, we'll be looking at um, a series of different villages. 75 villages will be the main part of the, the data set. They'll each be about 1,000 people. And um, they would go in. They, the, the employees were told to, to talk to teachers self-help group leaders, and shopkeepers. So they were looking for these key individuals in the village, and then telling them, and then spreading the information via them. Okay, so that they would start that, and then the, the information would go through the network. And what was happening is, in some of the villages they were entering, they were getting very low participation, and in other villages, they were getting very high participation. And it wasn't worth their while to go into a village where nobody was participating. So part of the reason they were willing to partner with us was they were trying to figure out why is it that we're getting such high variation in villages that look essentially identical from demographic perspectives. Similar villages, similar areas, geography, um, uh, per capita income, a whole series of economic variables, very similar villages and very different outcomes. So in our data, the minimum participation rate was about 7%. The max was about 44%. And so um, what we're going to do is try and understand the diffusion process and try and understand how that depended on the initial nodes that were informed and to what extent that explains what was going on. And then try and figure out, is there a nice way of identifying who these people are that are good information spreaders and how do we f do that in general in the networks? Okay, so that's the basic structure. Um, so here, um, 75 villages, relatively isolated from microfinance initially. Um, just for, for what does microfinance mean? Microfinance in this case is a loan that was made to a household. Um, a woman, they were only, the only people who are eligible as women between the ages of 18 and 57 years old. One loan per household. And um, these loans were, were given in Grameen style. So, so they were actually put into groups of five women and, and jointly liable. But the, the, the the loans were uh, roughly 10,000 rupees, which is about $200 during the, at that time period, um, for over a 50-week period, with fairly high interest rates. Interest rates a little bit above a credit card interest rate, so, um, but, but lower than money lending rates in the village. Okay, so, so they were eligible for these loans. And um, what we did is we surveyed the networks um, before, actually, and after the microfinance went into place. The bank subsequently entered 43 of these villages and started offering microfinance. Um, at the end, very end, I might say a little bit, it turns out the financial crisis hit and they stopped entering villages. So we have a series of villages they entered and some they didn't. And we can see the effects of microfinance on the network structures. And I'll say a little bit about that at the very end. So then we tracked microfinance diffusion over time. Yes? Uh, only women were allowed to take out a loan, one per household. 
Uh, so for various reasons, part of the reason is that, you know, that it's an attempt to, to improve women's standing in, in the developing world. And there's some evidence that having no, the money come into the household through the woman, even if it does end up being spread out through the household, gives them, empowers them and, and improves their lives in various ways. I won't go into that in detail, but, but I think that's the thinking behind the offering it to women. Um, th there's a variety of reasons that they, they did that. And limiting it to one per household is a way of making sure they don't get too indebted. And, um, okay. So here we are in Karnataka. Um, roughly all the villages were within about a, a two hour, two to three hour um, trip from Bangalore. Um, typical village, you know, these are relatively poor, agricultural, some dairy production, um, sericulture, so that's silkworm production, um, finger millet, day labor. Um, so there's a variety of, of different professions. Um, so then what we did is we went in we interviewed the households and mapped out the social networks. So for instance, this is one of the villages. Um, you can see the rough size of the village. The little dots here are the adults. So we don't have children pictured and we're not allowed to interview children. Yeah, so these, these little dots, the little teeny dots are, are individuals and then they're clumped into households. So there might be num a number of generations living in the same household. And then what we did is we interviewed um, adults in the village and then we asked, for instance, this is the borrow question, if you needed to borrow um, 60 rupees or 50 rupees for a day, to whom would you go? So we, we get a, an answer from the adults of who they would borrow from. Then we asked who comes to you to borrow uh, money and, and so forth. So we have a series of different questions and these are going to be um, networks that are going to be weighted and uh, directed in terms of how many questions people answer. Um, it might be that I answer that I borrow from you, um, but you don't borrow from me, and so forth. So there's going to be a lot of information here. Um, we have, you know, we asked them, who do you go to pray with? Uh, who do you go to to ask for important advice? Um, who comes to you to borrow kerosene or rice? Um, who, who do you go to in an, in an emergency for medical help? And just in terms of, you know, if you're trying to collect network data, there's two reasons for asking very specific questions rather than just asking. Uh, so first of all, we could have just gone in and asked, who are your friends? Well, it, it's hard for people to name friends in the abstract. It's easier if you give them specific kinds of interactions you have. And also it gives us different pictures because they, they might do different things with different people. So the people that they borrow kerosene and rice from might not be the same people that they ask for advice from. So, so there's differences that go on across the different relationships. And so it's useful to have this, what's known as multiplex data as well. Okay, so for the purposes of this talk, what we're gonna do is aggregate all of these relationships up so that there's just a relationship between two households if they answered yes to any one of these questions in either direction. Okay, so we're building a very weak network in the sense that um, anything that you, you, if we have any contact between two households in these surveys, then we'll, th we'll think of these households as being connected. And the idea of that is twofold. One is we think information could pass back and forth between the households if they were connected. And secondly, we didn't want to data mine too much in terms of trying to fit, you know, given that we only have 75 villages, if we start trying to fit um, in detail, uh, which is the most important network and, and how these things matter, um, we would overuse the data. And so, so we're just going to stick with a relationship um, if, if, there, if there's any answer, yes. And roughly, um, so if we look at a, a typical village, that gives us roughly uh, about 200, house, 200 households per village. And the average degree here, number of connections to other households would be on the order of 15. So a typical household, even though when we're aggregating all, for all these things, they're still only connected to about 15 other households. So the, 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 the network is still relatively sparse, even though they look dense from the pictures. Okay, so that's the sort of underlying data that, that we have. Um, you know, then we have a lot of demographics. So we have caste, education, um, uh, we have wealth variables, um, information about the number of rooms in the house, profession. Uh, so there's a lot of information in the background. And here, um, this is drawn uh, with UCI net. You hear what I did was just, you know, break it into um, general and otherwise backward casts, so more advantaged casts, and then scheduled cast, scheduled tribe, disadvantaged casts. We talked about this a little bit in, in the um, first lecture, but you do see there's going to be a lot of social structure here 
uh, underlying the data. So here you can begin to see that you know, the, um, there's not as many ties across caste groups as there are, are within caste groups. Yes? Oh, yes, yeah, 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 yes. So um, a couple of words on that. Yes, the, the, the networks um, vary dramatically by gender. And in the first wave, um, so we've now we have two waves of data. In the first wave, we, o we only had about, um, we didn't have as much coverage in terms of getting all of the adults in the household. So we only had about 50% coverage. So we tried to make sure we got an adult in each household, but sometimes it was male and female. So there's more noise in the original data. The second wave, what we've done, gone back, and we've tried to get about n somewhere between 90 and 97 percent of the of the adults, depending on the village, to try and make sure that we um, uh, eliminate some of that noise. So, so there is noise um, in in the data I'm going to talk about based on whether you interview men or women, because the, the, their networks do look different, and there's strong gender biases in the in the networks. So that's something underlying this the data here. Okay, so, so you'll see cuts in the data. Um, there's, there's a lot of structure there. Okay, so, so now let's think about how uh, initial injection points matter and how we should measure their role. And, you know, as, as I said in the first lecture, um, you know, there's sort of a long tradition in, in looking at these things. In particular, one question is, is, is hitting the right nodes important? As you can guess, this is sort of an important question in marketing. You know, how to identify key people for, for getting news out um, or, or advertising and so forth. So there's a pretty long literature on that, including things in, in computer science. Um, but what, what I'm going to do is just go through a, a few different centrality measures here and then try to tell you what we developed in terms of a theory and, and then take it to the data. So the first thing we could do is just count how many links a given household has. And one idea would be you know, the best diffusing households would be the ones that have the most connections, right? And so this goes back to this sort of friendship paradox we talked about. You know, people with more connections might be more influential just because more people are paying attention to them. So if we were looking at this, you know, we picked the person with seven. Here we picked the person with six. So that's the most obvious measure for centrality. Okay. Um, now, that becomes a problem when we start looking more deeply at the network structure. And if we look, you know, here we've got two twos. But obviously, a, a two that's connected to a seven and a six is much better at spreading information than a two who's sort of more peripheral and connected to two twos. So one question is, how do you define centrality when we want to make sure that we have the ability to go beyond just immediate connections and think about a diffusion process where something might be going many steps? Okay. So um, as, as uh, Ben talked about in, in one of the lectures, one measure that, that is used to sort of capture this idea is what's known as eigenvector centrality. And the idea is very simple. What we do is we think, okay, instead of just counting how many connections somebody has and measuring their centrality, let's think of the, the, the weight of those people's centrality in, in accounting for the centrality. So instead of just summing up, I have 10 friends and somebody else has five, we'll sum up the, the centrality of my friends and sum up the centrality of that person's friends and then use that as the measure. So now we end up with a system that says, you know, this person's centrality is proportional to their friend's centrality. So if we have a matrix which indicates network, you know, GIJ is one if you're connected and zero if you're not, then we end up being able to write this just as an eigenvector uh, calculation where the centrality is proportional to the network times the centrality vector. So, so this is another way of sort of you know, thinking through where this um, centrality measure comes from in terms of eigenvector centrality. We're just you know, using this kind of, of structure. Okay? So this might be a different way. And the idea here is now, if we think about diffusion, I'm going to be a good diffuser. I'm connected to other people who are good diffusers. And so I, I, we want to use some sort of iterative method instead of just a straight count. Okay, question, is that clear? Questions on that? Okay, so if you go back and you do the eigenvector calculations for that previous network, then we find that this person is about three times more central than this other person um, when we do an eigenvector calculation. So this is capturing you know, some s aspects of better position in the network that were completely absent when we're just looking at degree centrality. Okay. So um, what we did is say, well, you know, both of these are sort of off the shelf. This isn't obviously 
something you'd want to use for diffusion because the diffusion is, is a process of information passing and it's not clear that this is exactly what's capturing information passing. So instead, what we did is just define a really simple measure based off of sort of a, an epidemiological process. So think of just a simple contagion process where things bounce from one node to another. So in particular, we have two parameters which are going to define a family of measures. And what we can do is say, how many nodes end up informed if some node I is initially informed and they randomly tell friends with some probability P, I randomly bump into friends, and then we iterate this T times. So there's some amount of time, and you can think of this as, you know, how, how important is this information? How often am I talking to people about it? And then T is how quickly do we get bored? Is it, you know, is it three days, four days? How many days are we talking about this before it, it's old news and we stop talking about it? So there's sort of two. One is the intensity and then how long it lasts. And so you can, just in terms of a picture, if we set P equal to 0.5 and T equal to 4, we start with some initial node, then we could just simulate that process and say how many nodes would hear if this was the process. So we go through, you know, they tell one of their friends the first day, they, they tell some more friends, this person happens to tell another friend. We run this for, for four periods, and we end up, you know, in this particular simulation, we end up with 13 nodes being informed. So we could say, okay, well, that's one estimate of how central this node is. We pick another node, we do the same kind of calculation, you know, after four periods, we've ended up with six nodes. So we'd say, okay, the first one looks roughly twice as good as the second one, okay? So, so this is just a simple way of directly defining centrality in terms of a diffusion process. Okay. So um, in, in terms of diffusion centrality, then if you remember, uh, Ben talked about this, yeah, Ben. Yeah, so um, one, could, right, one can think of lots of different ways in which you could specify this measure. And you can build much richer models. You could have different people have different probabilities of passing. You could have decay over time in terms of the passing rates. Um, so you can imagine lots of models. I think the point here is just more that it's important to have a model. And this is a simple one. The second point is that this one is actually going to nest. So as we take, as we look at limits of this process, we will naturally get to eigenvector centrality. We'll naturally get um, to degree centrality. And so it nests the other one. And so this is just a nice way of doing it. But you could imagine richer models than what we're working with. Yeah. OK. So if you remember from, from Ben's talk, um, if we, if we want to think, if we want to do this calculation, we don't want to necessarily have to simulate it all the time. So simulating this process could be quite cumbersome. We'd like sort of a simple way of doing a calculation. So instead, what we can do is keep track of what's the number of walks from uh, one node to another of some length. Then P times that is, is effectively what's the probability of, what's the expected number of times that something following this process would go from I to J. And so diffusion centrality can um, be defined just by summing from 1 to T this calculation of P times G raised to the Tth power. And that'll give us, instead of actually giving us what's the probability of information going from one node to another, it sort of gives us what's the expected number of times that other people are going to hear information that started at node I after T periods. Okay. So this is a simple calculation, which now allows us just to use linear algebra to do a calculation of, of how central any given node is in the network. Okay. So based on a simple diffusion process. Is that clear? Okay. So we've got this diffusion centrality. What can we say about it? Um, well, if communication occurs just once, so if, if, T, if, if we just talk once, then basically all you're doing is counting how many neighbors I have. Um, and so then it's going to be proportional to degree centrality. As T goes to infinity, then this is going to converge towards eigenvector centrality. And in particular, what you can show, so the, the, the one theorem that we prove in the paper, actually in the appendix of the paper, is that if T is 1, then we get degree. Um, as T goes to infinity, then depending on whether P is bigger or smaller than the first 1 over the first eigenvalue, you either get convergence or divergence of this sum. If it converges, 
um, then it converges to what's known as uh, Katz Bonnichet's centrality. If it diverges, then it actually um, becomes proportional to eigenvector centrality far enough along the limit. So uh, effectively, if for people who don't know these two different definitions, they didn't see Ben's lecture. Um, basically, wh what's important here is that this is nesting at the extremes. On one extreme, it looks like you're just going once, you're getting degree centrality. As you're going an infinite number of times, then it begins to look like eigenvector centrality. And most diffusion processes are actually going to be somewhere in between. They're, you're going to talk about some, something for a while, and then it's going to die off in terms of its interest. You're not going to keep talking about it forever. And so we would expect most processes to go beyond one hop in less than an infinite number of hops. And so using some other measure of diffusion centrality, you can imagine would do better than degree centrality or eigenvector centrality at, at fitting the data. Okay. Okay. Um, what's the ideas of the proof of this? Um, I won't go into the proof, but it's effectively a diagonalization argument. So you can diagonalize the, uh, the, the, the matrix and then look at the limits of that in a natural way and, um, and show it converges. And uh, there's a little bit you have to worry about because not all the matrices are diagonalizable, but you can show that the, you can get limits of, of nearby matrices in cases when it's not. Okay. So um, three hypotheses then. So if we go back to the problem that the bank was having, one hypothesis is, well, in villages where they got high participation, that was because they hit high people in terms of degree centrality. Another hypothesis is places in high that where they got good diffusion of information was because the initial people that they talked to instead had high eigenvector centrality. And then instead we might ask, um, maybe it's high diffusion centrality that determined whether or not they got a, a lot of take up in a village. Okay, so those are three different hypotheses. Now, one question you might have is, these two measures don't require any specification of parameters. This measure requires a P and a T, right? So we have to specify P and T somehow. And one possibility is actually to, to fit P and T from the data. But instead of doing that, we might want to fix it so we're not biasing the test towards, you know, if we're allowing us to fit it, then, then we're obviously going to do better than either of the extremes because we can fit them as special cases. So what we did is we actually fixed P to be one over the first eigenvalue, and we fixed T to be calendar time based on the amount of time that the bank was in the, in the um, villages. So that, that allowed us to, to have a fixed P and T and not allow those to be fit to the data. So, so then we have three different measures, um, each coming from a different um, idea. Okay? Okay. So bank f informed a few people in each village. We know who they informed. We know what the networks are, up to some noise. Um, we know who eventually showed up. So now we can go through and see whether higher centrality of those initial points translates into higher um, eventual participation. Okay, so here's the first picture. Um, what, what's on this axis? This is looking at what we call the leaders. These are the people that the bank was told these are the important people in the village to talk to that they first informed. And this is the average degree. So this is on average, um, so this would be one village. In this village, the shopkeeper, self-help group leaders, and teacher had um, an average degree of 22. So they, they were talking to roughly 22 other households on average. What was the participation rate in this village? This was a, the 7% village. Um, you can get, you know, so all these points are different villages. And here we clearly see that degree centrality is not positively correlated with uh, the eventual take up. If anything, the point estimate is slightly negative and insignificant. So, so it doesn't look like degree centrality is explaining anything that's going on. Is that, is the graph clear? Okay. Um, second possibility is eigenvector centrality. So we do the same, the same uh, test for eigenvector centrality. Now you get a positive relationship. So villages with more central households in terms of eigenvector centrality did see higher participation rates in terms of the eventual diffusion. And this is statistically significantly positive um, when you look at the data. Um, when you do the diffusion centrality, you, you also get a positive relationship. And in fact, you get a tighter relationship. It's a little harder to see from this graph. But here's a set of regressions where we regress what was the participation rate of microfinance in the village 
against the different uh, centrality measures of the leaders in the, ho ho uh, leaders in the village. And here um, th we do get both diffusion centrality and eigenvector centrality are um, statistically significant. Um, what's important is looking at the R squareds here. So what do the R squareds tell us? They tell us how much of the participation variation across these villages did we actually explain by looking at these injection points. And you know, most of them are around 30%. And then when you throw in diffusion centrality, you get up to about 47%. Now, if you actually fit the P and the T instead of using the P and T being fixed, then you can get this up to about 60%. So the diffusion centrality seems to be explaining, uh, or at least correlating, with what's going on in the villages um, in terms of the eventual participation. So it, it does do better than others at, at explaining the variation in the data. Okay. Yeah, so basically there's, um, the, the, there's a bunch of covariates that we're using here. Number of households, whether, um, what's the participation rate in self-help groups, what's the fraction of, of the population that have savings, um, and what's the fraction in the forward casts. So, so we use some control variables, and, that, and basically that gives you roughly about a 0.26 if you just run those. And then when you add these other centrality measures, it bumps up a little bit, and then you get a much more substantial increase in explanatory power when you throw in diffusion centrality. Okay. Yes? Sorry. Right, right. So then what you do is... No, yeah, yes. No, no, no. So that's just one P and T. The best fit P and T is about P equals 0.2 and T equals 3. So if you just had to estimate and pick one PT for this kind of process, it looks like people talk to their friends about 20% per period and do it for three periods. So the best P and T fit seems to be about 0.2 and, and T about 3. And that, that's just a constant one. If you fit individual P's and T's to, to each village, then you can do even much better, yeah. This is just fixing one P and T for the, for the whole set. Okay. Okay, so, so basically um, we, we found out how to measure centrality for diffusion or, or how to improve on, on existing measures by just putting in a simple model. That's one message. Now, um, that, that's not very useful for the bank, right? Why isn't it very useful for the bank? Well, the bank then said, well, look, you know, you guys went in you interviewed all the households. We interviewed all the households. Um, we, we map out all these networks. Uh, at that point, it would have been a lot simpler for the bank just to tell people rather than go in, map out the network, you know, map out the centralities. So it's not you know, going door-to-door -door -door this way is too intensive. So now we need to figure out some way of, of identifying these nodes that have high centrality. And so the question is sort of how do we do that? And so one thought we, we, we had was, well, maybe people can tell us. Right? Maybe people, if we go in, we, we can learn from people who the central people are in the village and use that information then to identify the people that we should tell to, to sort of get the news to spread. Okay? Yes? Right, so I, I, I think, I mean, fundamentally, it's, it's the fact that when you look at this process, What's happening is, what, if, if you're measuring um, degree centrality, you're cutting the picture off here, right? So you're not allowing it to diffuse anywhere beyond the, just one step. If you're doing eigenvector centrality, then you're sort of letting this process just keep going and going and going. And what's happening is information spreads to some extent, and then people get bored or stop talking. So they don't just keep, and I think what's happening is the diffusion centrality is capturing the fact that this goes for some tier number of periods, but it doesn't go infinitely long, and it goes more than just once. And, and so you need something which goes intermediate to really pick up what's happening in the data. And, and that seems to be why it's a much better model for, for picking out central nodes than, than the others. Yes? Am I right in thinking that the diffusion centrality measure you have is slightly different than this? Because it doesn't count, it counts the cycles? Yeah, exactly. So, so what we're doing is we're allowing echoes and so forth. So, so the actual calculation we used is slightly different. And we did that for reasons of it's easier to calculate. And it also then nests the other two as extreme points. So we can prove that first theorem for our version. But it is, it's allowing for echoes 
So in, in the three periods, it allows you know, this person to hear twice and so forth. Yeah, it's going to bias things. Uh, so it's going to end up more biased in nodes with lots of cycles in them too. Um, so it depends on the structure of the. Uh, so uh, yeah, it, it depends on on how echoey the the network is, and th that can be quantified actually. Um, but I, I'm happy to talk about that offline. Okay. Um, so so then we get to this question again of um, you know people's knowledge of centrality. Can people name central individuals? So what we thought to do is just go into the village and ask. And obviously we can't go in and ask them, you know, do you know who's diffusion central in your village? So what we asked them was, you know, if we have information we want to get out in your village, who sh to whom should we talk to try and, you know, pass information along? So can they name um, central people? Why might they be able to do that? And, and then we did some follow-up experiments, which actually ask, are the people that they're naming really good diffusers. So they're naming, maybe they name people who turn out to be highly central, but does that actually translate into good diffusion? And so we did some experiments subsequent to this, and I'll show you the experiments. Um, they're going to name people who are central, and they're going to name people who are good diffusers. So I just want to go through sort of why that might be true and, and how that works. Okay, so what we did is we asked people, um, every adult who's a good starting point, again, we'll work with households. Um, here we just went into 33 villages um, to do this part of the uh, analysis. So we went into 33 villages. We asked them who, did, who, who they thought was good for diffusing information. And in particular, what we asked was, if we want to spread information about a new loan product to everyone in your village, to whom should we speak? And then we also asked, um, we thought maybe, maybe they'll be biased in, in, in who they name about loan products because they, they think it's financial or they think there might be some limits in the number of loans or something. So we also asked if we want to spread information to everyone in the village about tickets to a music event or drama or a fair, you know, who should we talk to just to see if there's differences. It turns out there's no difference basically between who they name for the two questions. So I'm going to focus mainly on who they name for the loan product. The results are essentially identical for the other question. We randomized uh, the ordering on, on how, how it came up on the tablets um, for, the, for the surveyors, yeah. But it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay, um, so a, a, a few things. Um, one is that people tend to focus on the same people. So, so good news, um, they tend to name the same people within a village. So if they're all naming very different people, if everybody's naming somebody different, then we probably wouldn't be getting much sense out of, of what was happening. So um, only 5% of the, the households are actually named. Conditional upon being named, um, the median is that you're named uh, nine times. So once one, one household has said, said, you know, go to Matt, then, um, uh, uh, then it tends to be that a lot of other households would as well. How many, how many people are asking this question? I mean, was there time with, between asking the first person and the last person that they would communicate inside the village, or you're more or less doing it simultaneously in the whole village? Um, it wasn't simultaneous because we had limited what numbers the, of teams. Time of the last, the it was within a day. It was all within a day. Within a day, people talk, which means yeah, 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 yeah. They could say, you know, they asked me this question, but we, and I told them that. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. They, they there could be contamination across yes. the surveys. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, yeah. And and, and and we can't control for that. I mean, it was you know, we sent in. Um, it was usually five teams in a village. Um, they were there for somewhere between four and eight hours. And so it's possible, it's possible that people said, oh, these, these you know, crazy people are coming in and they kept asking me who's a good diffuser. And, um, and I said, Sergio, and you should say Sergio too. Yeah, so that's possible. Um, so if, so it's, it's possible that they're doing that. But, but it, it'll turn out that they're good at naming. So even though they're all, maybe they're leaking that information, they're still going to name people who are central. Okay, so, so let's look quickly at that. So... Um, Here's uh, a, a few different categories, and let me sort of tell you, parse the categories. So what's the difference between the red and the blue? The red is just what's the fraction of the population in a given category. So 90% of the population in a given village was not nominated and is not uh, a leader. So is not a self-help group leader, teacher, or shopkeeper. So we'll look at both you know, leaders and, and um, being nominated. So. Um, most of the people 
were not nominated and, and are not a leader. Some people were not nominated but are a leader. Um, and that's a little more than, it's roughly 12% of the population. Some people were nominated and not a leader. And some people were nominated and a leader. And what, what the blue, um, what the level of these things is, is telling us is what's the probability that these people are in the top 10% of centrality according to diffusion centrality. So if we ask, are, are these people highly diffusion central? What we find is the people who are nominated and leader, if you're, if you're named by somebody and have leadership status, there's almost a 50% chance that you are in the top 10% of, of diffusion centrality in the village. Conditional. Yes, conditional. conditional probability. Conditional on this, on then this is my probability. <clears throat> if I'm nominated but not a leader, then I'm at about 25%. If I'm not nominated and a leader, I'm at somewhere around 17, 18%. And if I'm not nominated and not a leader, I'm at about 9%. So, so basically, there's a really low chance that I'm in the top 10%. Um, you know, basically, um, you're getting improvement and nominations are doing better than leadership status at picking out um, central people. So we already get some impression that if you wanted to find highly diffusion central people, asking people in the village to name people would be better than just trying to pick people that we might have thought. Maybe our thought is shopkeepers are going to be highly central because they interact with lots of people. Or teachers are going to be highly central because they interact with lots of people. So, so we're thinking you know, to identify people according to that. And this is saying you know, the nominations are, are picking out people with a higher probability of being highly central than, than the um, leadership status. Yes, 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 good point. Um, so, so the question was, is it possible to look at sort of demographic characteristics of people and predict whether they're gonna be nominated? And are, are there certain people who are gonna be highly central and nominated? And can we predict that based on demographics? Is that, and yes, indeed. Um, so the, the chance of being highly central increases with your age, with your education level, with your wealth level. Um, so there's a whole series of different variables that'll be highly predictive. Cast also predicts it depending on the, the village cast structure. Um, so there's a number of variables that you can use to actually predict this as well. And, and we'll sort of show that, that they're, they're actually telling us something that even if you use the demographics, you couldn't have, have quite predicted. Yes? Um, so, you know, we didn't um, actually prohibit that, but I don't think anybody named themselves. Um, in the villages, so, but that, that, that was something we didn't make clear to our surveyors. We didn't, we didn't prohibit um, people naming themselves. No, we didn't, we, didn't ask any, we didn't ask them any questions about what their beliefs were about themselves, but we didn't prohibit them from naming themselves. Yes. How many people? No, they could just name one. In fact, in this, in this part of the experiment, they could just name one. Yes, 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 very good point. Right, so, so the question um, was, you know, if, if we want to actually optimally diffuse things, we don't necessarily want to just pick one, we might want to pick a, a set of people. And then if you want to pick a set, you don't, you don't want to just rank the top three people because maybe they're all friends with each other and that's not a very good spread around the network. And indeed, there's a paper by Kempe, um, Kleinberg, and Tardosh, which sort of looks at that problem of finding an optimal set of nodes for a, for a, a different, slightly different pro problem. But it's, a, it's an NP-complete problem. So it's not easy to find the optimal set of nodes um, for this kind of thing. But, but I can give you some heuristic algorithms that, that might work well in this kind of setting. Basically, picking across cast groups is going to be really a useful thing to do. Um, but, but generally, you know, the, 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 it's not an easy problem to find the optimal set of nodes. Yeah. But uh, these are on the graph, these are named diffusers, not reviewed. Right, right. So, so I'll, go, I'll go through. So then we did some additional experiments that will try and get at how good the people are that, that are being named at actual diffusion. Um, so so that I'll, I'll go through that. But let me, I'll get through this first and then go to that. Okay, so here we have, you know, just the number of nominations and what's my diffusion centrality in terms of standard deviations. Um, and, and basically, um, you know, getting more nominations pushes you up in, in diffusion centrality. Um, it also predicts, being nominated also predicts eigenvector centrality, um, you know, diffusion centrality. Um, 
being nominated increases your diffusion centrality by about a half a standard deviation. Um, similarly for eigenvector centrality, it increases your chance of being a leader by about uh, you know, 0.4. Um, I won't go through this in time. Okay, so, so now a question before we get to the actual experiment of, of how good diffusions were, we can ask a question of how might it be that people could learn to name good central people in the village even though they can't, they can't draw a network and they, they don't know how to, to, to um, tell us who their friends of friends are. Okay, so think of this the following process. This is, this is where gossip comes into it. Um, some news comes through the network, like Arun moved to Stanford. Um, Matt has a new MOOC. Um, Esther won an award. Okay, so, so these kinds of things start at given nodes and then spread randomly. And they spread randomly by the same process that we were talking about before with some P and T. But now instead of thinking about the node itself and how good a spreader it is, we're instead going to think of a node as a listener. So I'm sitting in the network and there's news about all these different people reaching me. Okay? And now you can ask me, how frequent is it that news about Arun reaches me? How frequent is it that news about Esther reaches me or Sergio or Ken or, you know, so, so I'm, I'm keeping track of this. And all I do is something really simple. I just keep track of a big vector in my head. I just have a big vector in my head and I have numbers and the numbers are just how often do I hear about Ken? How often do I hear about Sergio and so forth, right? And now I do something really naive. I just say, I think the most central people are the people I hear about all the time. So I, I, I don't even think about that. I just sort of rank them based on, if I hear about somebody a lot, I must think that they're important. They're going to be a good diffuser. Okay. Now here, what we're going to do is we're going to assume that information about people is coming at equal rates. So it, it, it starts out from the initial nodes at equal rates. It could be that maybe news about people who are, you know, maybe there's, bad news about people and good news about people and some of it spread more strategically and so forth. We're going to erase all that and just think of a really mechanical process where there's some news and what's important about the news is I can trace it back. This is news about Arun or this is news about Esther and so forth. So but different kinds of news <coughs> may, may spread at different pace. Yeah. May, may affect this a lot. Yeah, exactly. So there will be, you know, news like uh, Matt read the newspaper, or <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Matt uh, uh, got the lottery, you know, got the yeah. lottery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. So, so here, 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 what we're going to do is we're going to give you some one heuristic sort of thing that say, if I'm living in this village for a long, long time, and news is just popping up, and let's suppose that a lot of this washes out, so that you know, Sergio wins the lottery as often as Matt does which is never, but um, so <laughs> you know, there, there, there are certain bits of news that come out and then th that news spreads. And so we have an, an equal chance to have heard about different nodes, then, then this is going to work. So this is an extreme, but I think it just gives us an idea that maybe you know, we might have some ability to be able to find nodes that we really hear about a lot. And that's not such a silly thing to then infer that those people might be highly central. Otherwise, that information wouldn't be getting to me at, a, at such a high rate. That, that's the main point, yeah. Yes, yeah. So if I could distinguish them and, and work with each different one in a different P, then I could, I could sort that. But now we've sort of put my rationality up a, a notch, where now I'm, I'm keeping track of, well, I've heard trivial information about Sergio. That must really mean he's central. Otherwise, it never would have gotten to me. Um, so, so we're not going to make that kind of inference. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is strange. Yes, yes. <laughs> Central, but the event may be right, right, right. Yeah, no, exactly. And so, so what's going to be important here is this is going to be sort of a long term average, right? So, so what we can do is, is, is it in the long run, you know, we're listening to people over and over and over again, and we keep getting this information. And if I live in this village my whole life, then eventually, you know, I can start telling you who's central. And, and the idea here is, you know, now I, I keep track of this, we use the same process. But now we're keeping track of it as a listener. What's the, the chance that I hear? And you can, you know, the proof is different, but, but the, the logic is similar. You know, every individual's ranking of others under network gossip will be according to the ranking of diffusion centrality for a large enough P and a large enough T. So if we wait long enough and we've got a large enough P so that information isn't dying out too quickly. So if it's information that only goes one or two nodes, it's never going to reach, reach me. But if it's large enough to, to actually reach out, 
and basically t has to be the size of the diameter of the network and, and p has to be um, not too small a fraction of the of one over the first eigenvalue then you get this to work okay so so if you've got um, something yeah so then then this this is going to converge to diffusion centrality okay so the last part is then we did a controlled experiment with this so now we've got we, we think people might be able to learn by by listening to the network they seem to be naming people who are highly central let's check whether the people they're naming are actually good diffusers does it actually work so now we, we picked another 213 uh, villages so working with with actually Esther and Abhijit and uh, JPALS is quite nice because you you have a whole apparatus for doing these kinds of experiments so we went into 213 different villages to try a new experiment and now the experiment is we spread information about a chance to win a cell phone so you can go out you can win a cell phone um, if, if it was basically pairing with a cell phone company that wanted to get cell phones into these villages. So uh, what we did is, is anybody who came could then, we would roll dice, and um, if it came up one, you won 25 rupees. If it came up two, you won 50 rupees, so forth. If it came up 12, you won a cell phone. So... Start at two. Starts at two, yes, sorry, yeah, yeah. If it came up one and one, yeah, <laughs> snake eyes, yes. Uh, um, yeah, if it came up one, then you were really unlucky. <laughs> 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 yes, 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 uh, yeah, okay. Okay, yes, yeah, yeah, <laughs> sorry, okay. So, th so then uh, what we did is in, in, now it's actually 71 in our, late, our full data now. So um, a third of the villages, we did a random assignment, so we randomly picked nodes to, to diffuse. A third of the villages, we picked village elders, so we looked for people that had sort of leadership status in the village. And in a third of them, what we did is we, we, we used the gossip nominations. So in all the villages, we went in and we interviewed people just, we, um, we went in, we picked 15 households and we asked them who's a good seed for spreading news. And then um, they could, uh, so we picked, the, the, we get 15 nominations this way, and then they could also name up to four village leaders and so then we took that information um, in each village. So we made sure the protocol was the same and it wasn't contaminated by using different protocols in different villages. But then in a third of them, we used random, randomly picked the, the injection points. A third of them, we picked the elders and then a third of them, we used gossip. Okay, so what happens? These are the random ones. This is the number of participants we got. Um, so sometimes we picked five seeds and so we weren't sure a priori how many seeds would it take to get some diffusion to go so half of the villages we picked three seeds and half of them we picked five seeds and we um and so here out of the random ones what happens is when we tried to pick five seeds we pick five households it might be then on the day when we tried to spread the information that household was boarded up nobody was home we couldn't reach them so sometimes five households became four or three or two. And that happened you know, ra randomly across villages who we were able to reach. So here, what's actually represented is the realization sometimes we got five, sometimes we got four, three, two, one. And then this is the number of participants that eventually came and participated, the number of households who eventually participated. So somewhere between zero and 20. Now, if you use the leaders, you get a little better. Yeah. A second. Yep. Uh, do you think this might be contaminated by households just not showing up because they already have a cell phone? Um, yeah, I mean, so, you know, so, so it's, it's, th there's, it could have been a higher participation rate and possibly if we're giving away just free money, um, we would have done better than, than free cell phones. This was one way of limiting how much money we had to give out. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's, it's not clear that it was fully attractive to, to people. And so you, but but I think the main thing is going to be the differences across these things rather than whether or not it diffused. So I think we'll get significant differences across the villages, which does suggest that there was something about those injection points that mattered and not just the prize itself. Right? So we didn't try to form ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the cell phones were not terribly expensive. I think they're worth roughly um, 30 to $35. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they were worth more than the 275. So they were worth substantially. So um, they would have been worth, let's see, 30, like, f yeah, more than a thousand rupees. So, so they were valuable. Yeah. 
Okay, so, so this is what happens in the villages where we use the, the gossip nominations. Um, so then you get you know, numbers that are, are higher on average. And you can just do the, you know, here's the distribution of how many responses you get across the different treatments. So the red here is the, the gossip when we actually use their nominations. Um, the blue one is the random, and the, the black dots here are the um, using the village elders. And these, you know, the, the, this effectively stochastically dominate. So you're getting more responses out of the treatments where you have, you're using the, the people they tell us to than using just the leadership status. Um. So maybe something, so, so you, you, you had the seed, and then what, you waited a day, you waited two days, and you two days. Everybody, and then what, you asked everybody or a random sampling? That no, no, so in two days, so what we told people is, you know, um, basically, here's, we're gonna be giving out cell phones, we're gonna be back in a couple days, um, tell your friends, and if they show up, then they can get, um, so they actually get, they got some information about how to reach us, and then we came back oh, two days later, and so then, who, who the people that showed up, yeah, how many, how many households, and we, we limited it to one per household again. So if four people from the same household, we counted it as one. But he's not my friend. I don't want him to get the cell phone. I want my friends to get it. So yeah, 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 yeah. You are giving incentives here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Spreading. And we actually... It's different than just... Spreading. Sure, sure, sure. So, so there's, uh, Sergio's point is that there's incentives of, of who I tell and what, whether I spread information and so forth. And actually, we have another paper with Emily Brazer where we look at people's incentives to spread information and we give a, we have a rival good where there's actually incentives to hide information and we get effects where we can show that people tell some of their friends and not all their friends. Here, I don't think that that's as much of an issue. It, it, from what we can tell, people were just happy. We, we told them there were unlimited numbers of cell phones to give out so that if everybody in the village showed up and wanted a phone, we'd give it to them. But you're right, maybe I don't want my enemy to have a cell phone and, and so I'm not sure that that's, uh, I, I, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. And you might have somebody who is uh, not very well connected, but is a figure, is a spiritual figure. So when you hear something from him, then you, you yes, do yeah, it yeah. because he says that it's worthwhile doing it. Is there, is there right, 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 yes. No, the, um, Al's point is that there, there could be, um, you know, there could be other things about these people who are making them good or bad diffusers because people listen to them or they have some influence in terms of making, getting people to act. <laughs> And that's not captured. So here we're looking at purely structural processes. And it could be that part of the reason they're doing well is because they're naming people who aren't necessarily central, but are also people who have good properties in terms of diffusion. And indeed, you know, you can sort of go through, um, I don't know if I have, yeah, no. <coughs> I don't, uh, um, we've tried to estimate some of that. And it appears that there's actually a lot of explanatory power in their gossip beyond just the centrality. So you can control for the centrality of the nodes that they tell us. So we went back into 60 of the villages and then mapped out the centrality of who they told us. And then once you control for that, then you're getting additional power. So it's likely that they're telling us something that we're not capturing in terms of the network structure, definitely. Yes? <coughs> okay. Yeah. You know who tell them to come to the... No, no. So we didn't trace that out. So we don't know exactly how the information... We don't know the path of the information in the network. Okay, um, in, in interest of time, I'll, I'll sort of skip this. It's sort of, well, one last point just as we're ending here. Um, and, and, you know, <coughs> what we did is, so, uh, yeah, I'll go here. So, okay, so in terms of the timeline, we, we went in, we surveyed 75 of these villages. Microfinance came in, but they didn't go into all the villages. And then we resurveyed the village. So we actually have sort of, um, a petri dish where we can see how did microfinance affect the villages. So microfinance, and this is something that uh, was talked about in today's lectures, you know, you can imagine that markets are interacting with the social structure. Are we seeing changes in social structure? And we're, right, we're basically um, finishing up the writing of a paper now where, you know, you can look across the, the different samples of the villages that got microfinance and non. They're more or less um, identical in terms of the distributions, in terms of where they sit. And what you're seeing is, if you got microfinance, and then we look afterwards, roughly the, the chance of a, of a link being present between two households is around 7.5%. And in the villages that got microfinance, it drops by significantly, it drops by about 0.13%. So you're getting about a sixth or so drop in the rate of which people keep 
relationships after you see microfinance come into a village. Um, we have a lot more that, look, that sort of looks into that black box. It turns out that they're, you know, they're breaking, it breaks up the social structure not just in terms of borrowing and lending relationships, but also in terms of advice relationships. Also, two people who aren't involved in my getting loans. So even if I don't get a loan, I start losing links. And so we're sort of going through that and trying to understand how that introduces additional inequality in the villages and so forth. So th there's actually a lot of richness in the data that we have how here. Much, how many households got microfinance on average? You know, um, age of 200 households. Yeah, 200 households, it was roughly 45 households that would get microfinance. Significant. Yeah, significant fraction, but not, not all of them. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so what are the sort of broader messages, I guess, I want you to take away from this? Um, you know, so the base, basic thing, the network structure and position does have some significant consequences, at least correlational ones in the data. So it allows us to see um, why it is that, that in one village we could get different participation rates than another. It seems to, to correlate with the initial position of the first informed. Um, these kinds of process-based models outperform off-the-shelf measures of centrality. And I think that's sort of a message for the students here in general. If you're working in networks, don't be afraid to sort of think up a model which fits your setting instead of trying to take something off the shelf that might not be appropriate uh, for, the, for the question that you're looking at. And, and this other one is people, even though we, we might be socially ignorant in terms of being able to name the network, we, we can still be fairly sophisticated in, in knowing things about who key people are in, in a network, and, and that's um, you know, even despite our sort of low network IQ. And then I think the last point is just a, a caution on these things. Whenever we're looking at, at interventions in, in villages like this, they come with unintended consequences, and understanding what those unintended consequences is is sort of really important for, for shaping further um, development and, and policies for, for these villages. Great, so I think that's probably a good place to stop. Um, thanks very much.